Adams State College. Great stories begin here. Quite a full house. Some familiar faces in the audience and others not so familiar. So if you're a first time uh, attendee to our lunchtime talks in science and mathematics, well, welcome. I we'll hope to see you here in a couple more weeks. We have two more talks left this semester. One two weeks from yesterday and then one the first week of December. So watch for those announcements. It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. James Bedard from the biology uh, program who is going to be starting off the presentation, I guess, and then turning it over to a couple of the students, Amber and Josh, who will be doing research with him this summer. So please help me welcome the speakers. Good. All right, so it's my pleasure to actually introduce this research to you. Uh, I wouldn't have been able to do it without the uh, help and hard work of uh, Josh Michoni and Amber Harlan. And basically what we've done is this year I have joined a group called the Genomics Education Partnership. And that's where we can take uh, genetic data and using computers actually annotate, find out genes, look at sequencing. So when Josh and Amber come up, they're going to specifically talk about one of the projects they worked on this summer with me called the annotation of Drosophila, Drosophila moabensis, and a particular part of the genome they looked at. So before I have them come up, I just want to briefly talk a little bit about uh, the Genomics Education Partnership. Now this partnership was the brainchild of Dr. Uh, Sarah Elgin, just to be called Sally. And she is a professor at the Washington University in St. Louis. And she had written a grant that got funded in 06 that allowed a large research institute to work with smaller colleges across the nation to actually teach undergraduates in genomics and molecular biology. So we partner with not only her, but also with the departments of biology science, other bi uh, computer science, biology, and the sequencing center for DNA in St. Louis. And the aim for this is to actually provide students the opportunity to work with large-scale genomic sequencing uh, and also annotate that data. So what that basically means is we have a large sequence of DNA, all these letters of A, C's, G's, and T's, and we try and make sense of it, see where there's genes, what they do, and so forth. So the main point, and this is the main point of this grant, uh, and recently it's also been renewed to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, so we still have funding for the next five years now. Really, uh, biology and molecular biology is getting into uh, the cutting edge of uh, what's called bioinformatics. So in bioinformatics, it's not just uh, going in the wet lab, running experiments and looking at your data. Now you can take data and spend months or years analyzing it through using computers. So the skills we want to develop for undergraduate students is not only to learn about genes and genomes, but also about all these genomics databases that are uh, upcoming. Basically, you have all these sequences, they go into a large computer database, and then we need people to analyze it. Uh, the benefit is, the work we do is, it's on brand new data. This is not something that's been done before. Anything that the students do, it's their data, it's brand new, it's novel. Uh, major scientists haven't even looked at it. So it's scientific discovery for them. And then the bigger labs will use this data later to study genes, look at diseases and development. The other nice thing about the GEP is we've already led to several uh, publications, or I should say Dr. Elgin and her group. And now that I have joined with Amber and Josh and a lot of future Adam students, Upcoming publications will also include their names as well. So just to give you guys a map of the uh, partner schools with the Genomic Education Partnership, you can see that we have already a large number since 2006. In 2006, I think there was about 20 schools that partnered up. And in 2010, we're at about 60 schools altogether. There's that state right here. We're the only school in Colorado that's part of this consortium. Our closest neighbors are Highlands University in New Mexico and Utah Valley University. 
So you notice there is quite a gap here. One of our goals for the next few years with the GAP is trying to get more of these schools out in the west, apart from California, to uh, join up uh, looking at it. And also, we've also expanded into areas of uh, Caribbean, uh, Caribbean, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and so forth. So the subject of our research. Well, you know, we're looking at genomics research. We could be studying any type of species here. The one that Dr. Elgin uh, focuses on in her research for decades has been the fruit fly, or Drosophila. And if you notice here in the science paper, they've listed the Drosophila genome. This is the complete sequence of all the chromosomes in Drosophila melogaster. Uh, this was completed in the year 2000. In 2002, they actually completed the genome, the Human Genome Project. Uh, and you know, we've heard a lot about that. You know, when it happened, why it happened, what can we do with it? Well, since then, there has been hundreds of genomes that have been sequenced thereafter. But the nice thing about doing bioinformatics work, looking at genomes, is we can pick any model organism and apply our knowledge and education to other <coughs> organisms as well. So you know, since these guys know how to annotate genes from fruit flies, they can do the same thing with human genes, uh, primates, uh, underwater organisms, uh, any types. Now when the Prosophila melogaster was completely sequenced in 2000, it took several years for them to annotate the genome. So what I mean by that is pulling apart all the A's, C's, G's, and T's and figure out where the genes are, what's going on in there. Drosophila melogaster kind of became the blueprint to look at other fruit fly annotations. So, so far, this is the only one that's been completed. As you look on this tree of life here with the fruit flies, there's a dozen other species that have not been sequenced yet or annotated. So we're currently sequencing each of these species and doing the gene annotations and then comparing those annotations and sequences to our model here of Drosophila melogaster. And just to give you guys a comparison in genome size and number of genes, in the human genome, it's about <coughs> 3 billion base pairs. And that accounts for about 20,000 or 23,000 genes in the human genome. Drosophila melogaster, it's a bit smaller, it's 165 million bases or A, C, Gs, and Ts. But it has surprisingly a <coughs> large number of genes, 14,000. And the interesting thing about that is, you know, a lot of these genes, we have uh, similarities, what we call as homologs, in our human counterparts. So a nice thing about looking at different organisms is we can find similar genes between different species and look at effects of disease and development on these different models and apply that knowledge to uh, human cases. And lastly, before I turn it over to uh, Josh and Amber, I just wanted to bring up the website for the Genomics Education Partnership, if you're interested in looking at it. It basically talks about uh, curriculum, uh, group members, uh, projects that have been done, uh, posters that we've done as well. So for you students especially, you know, this today's part of a recruiting tool as well. Uh, if you guys are interested in this, check out this website and contact me. And uh, hopefully, you know, as you upcoming biologists get into your second, third year, you may have some interest to do some research with me. And I should make one notice that was critical for uh, uh, this group was because of the education partnership, we were able to develop a new course at Adam State called Molecular Biology II which really focuses on bioinformatics and students in the lab actually get to do real publishable laboratory work for the semester. And if it wasn't for Josh and Amber, we wouldn't be able to uh, uh, have this course already at our school. So special thanks to them on that. All right, so with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Josh first, who's gonna give uh, brief definitions uh, to kind of guide you guys on um, their example annotation they're going to give. Then Amber will give an example annotation that they've done. And then at the end, Josh will point through some trouble spots that we can have on typical <coughs> annotations. Hey, thank you, Dr. Bizarre. 
Okay, so the first thing that we need to do before we start talking about an actual project is get some basic ideas and terminology down. Um, so in translating a DNA sequence into protein, amino acids make up the protein sequence. Um, when you talk about a protein, all it is is a string of amino acids and the order that they're arranged in give that protein its specific function and properties. Next, amino acids are determined by three adjacent nucleotides forming a codon. So when we talk about A's, C's, G's, and T's, three of those combined form a codon, and that is what specifies a specific amino acid. And next, the unique, unique excuse me, codon sequence determines what the amino acid sequence is at that location. So, so for some key vocabulary, um, CONTIG is just a section of an organism's DNA, and we do this because an organism's entire genome is really big, so we want to divide it into sections to make it easier for study. Next we have isoforms. Um, isoforms are just different combinations of exons um, yielding a different protein. And then next we have exons, which are the coding sequence in a gene. So when we talk about a protein, the DNA that is used to determine that protein is referred to as an exon. And we have some figures in the next slide here. So what we have here is just a model of a piece of DNA. And we have introns in here, which is our next term, and we have exons. So the only thing that is used to determine a protein are exons, and these all um, converge to form an mRNA strand, which is then used to translate into DNA, I mean into protein, excuse me. So next we have introns, which were the non-coding pieces, so they're removed in a process referred to as splicing, and it's just a complex of proteins that go in, they cut the DNA, section out the exons, allow them to um, merge together to form one mRNA, or to be able to, yes, form one mRNA after transcription. And then we have an ATG site. And ATG is a codon. So on our next slide, ATG is right here, except it's converted into AUG because mRNA uses uracil instead of thymine. And what that does is refer to it as a star codon. So every single protein has this unique codon that signals the start of the protein. So that's what we have to look for first in the DNA. Next we have our A, G, and G, T sites. Um, these sites are part of the introns, and they indicate where an intron begins and ends. So we have up here for our introns, our G, T site would be located right here at the end and our AG site would be located in the beginning. And those are the two sequences that we use to um, remove the introns because that's where they, because we know that's where they are. So next we have codon, which we've gone over. And um, here's just a chart. So when you take all this <coughs> C's, A's, G's, and um, because the codons are put into, or the DNA is put into RNA before translation, it's a uracil instead of thymine. And here's all the possible combinations yielding uh, 20 amino acids. So you can have different combinations and yield the same amino acid. And that's what we're looking for as far as what makes up the protein in our annotation process. So next we'll have Amber talk about exactly what we do in a annotation and the methods that we use to um, come up with a final gene model. <clears throat> okay, so when we start an annotation, what we're basically attempting to do with this piece of DNA is determine exactly where are those start and stop sites for an exon. Where is this AG site? Where is this GT site? And uh, get rid of the, basically, the introns in between. So this is the genome browser. This is the first page you would bring up in, a, uh, in the start of your annotation. And there's uh, uh, quite a few things that are important about this page. The first thing that I'd like to point out to you 
is the amount of bases that we're looking at. Uh, you can see in this span right here, we have 10 kilobases, so we have 10,000 base pairs. So we're looking at quite a bit of nucleotide. So we're going to use some techniques to determine where we're actually going to be looking at specifically, because it would take much too much time to go through every single base pair. <coughs> Another thing that I'd like to point out to you is that uh, we have these, uh, these computer programs that help us uh, kind of guide us along our path. And these computer uh, programs use algorithms to help us determine where these AT and GT sites are going to be. So we'll go ahead and take a first look at our contig. Um, this is just a closer up version of that last picture. We can see that we have two genes in our contig. And these are denoted by the starting letters at the beginning of these black sequences. So we have gene LGS, and we have gene CG1909. So we are going to pick one of these genes to annotate. Um, another thing that I'd like to point out is that we see different isoforms as well. So an isoform is denoted by the PA and the PB right here. So we have two isoforms in this gene, while we only have one isoform uh, in this gene. And remember that an isoform is just a slightly differently spliced gene that would yield a slightly different product. <clears throat> so we choose uh, gene CG1909, and we go to a, a computer program called Gene Finder. And this is going to help us compare our sequence um, of nucleotides back to melanogasters. Because remember when Dr. Bedard first came up, he told us that melanogaster has been completely sequenced and annotated. So we know where all of its AT and GT sites are. So we're going to compare our contig, which is from a different species, Drosophila mohavensis, back to melanogaster. So as we see here, um, and this would move over, so I say that there are nine exons present. If you had slid the bar over, there would be the rest of the um, exons um, in sequence. But each column denotes a new exon. And we see also that melanogaster has two isoforms as well. So we're seeing two isoforms in mohavensis, and we're seeing two isoforms in um, melanogaster. So this, that, that's good. We're seeing um, uh, uh, similarities between the two sequences. Um, we would also like to use these sequences to compare back to our content. So we'll go ahead and export our sequences um, from melanogaster. So we're just taking those nucleotides and we're copying, over, uh, copying them over to a new uh, program. <coughs> And this new program is called BLAST. So a BLAST compares the nucleotide sequence from Mohavensis to Melanogaster. And we can do this with uh, any of the species. <coughs> you just have to have the nucleotide sequence. Um, so we would put in, as our query sequence, our contig. So our nucleotide sequence that we are trying to figure out our AAT and GT sites. And our subject sequence would be the exported nucleotide sequences from Mohavin, or excuse me, from Melanogaster that we just um, obtained. And this is kind of the result of uh, this is the result of a blast. So we're going to go ahead and start with our first exon. Each new exon is denoted by the caret uh, up in the left-hand corner. Uh, there's quite a bit of information that we obtain from this blast. And the first that I'd like to point out is when we were back at our genome browser, um, we were seeing that <coughs> there were tons and tons of base pairs. This 37,670 denotes where our ATG site would start. So we're, we're seeing a matching of Mohavensis nucleotides to melanogaster nucleotides at this point. Um, another thing to point out is that we have our starting methionine, so that's always important. We always need that to start out our protein and to start out our first exon. Um, and then we also see that we have 
a length of 12 exons, or excuse me, amino acids, and we only have 10 amino acids that are denoted in this exon. So that's really important because we're going to see that instead of ending, our exon ending at this site, it's going to end further along because we're missing two amino acids. And you can see that by the two numbers, the length here um, in the Lanagaster compared to our sequence. So um, we are going to be moving down the sequence to find our insight. And I'll, I'll come back to that and, and show you that as well. One other thing that is important is that we look at what frame we're in and that it is a negative frame. So this is all gonna come together on the next slide. All right, so this is back at our genome browser. We have our information from our last sequence and now we're gonna take that information and apply it here. So I go to my genome browser and look at the specific site that was denoted uh, given to us in the BLAST. So it, remember, it was 37,670. When I go to that nucleotide base, I find that it's right, the ATG site is right at that spot that BLAST uh, told me to look. So that's good. Um, we have found our starting methionine, and so this is the start of our first exon. One other thing is that I, I mentioned before that our frames are reversed. So a reversal of frames just means that we're looking at the negative strand instead of the positive strand. So I would be reading from right to left if I had not reversed the frame. So it's real easy, you click a button that says reverse and oh, magically now I have, I can read from left to right instead of from right to left, which is a lot easier than trying to do all of this backwards. All right. I had also mentioned that there, we were in frame three. Now when I talk about a frame, I mean these sequences of bars that are underneath uh, the nucleotides. So this frame up here is frame one. So you can see the corresponding gray, dark gray bar to light gray bar to dark gray bar is frame one. Frame two would be this next light gray bar to dark gray bar and so on. And I said that we were in frame three. So our starting methionine is in frame three, and so we can consider that this is uh, the starting methionine. So now we're gonna look for the insight. We found the start site for our first exon. Now we're gonna look for the insight. Uh, remember that Josh spoke about a GT site, so that's what we're going to be looking for is a GT nucleotide sequence. We find a GT sequence around 37,632 base pairs. Now that uh, does not match up to the query sequence that was given in the blast. If you remember, if I'll, I'll go back here and show you. I, we see a insight at 37,641. But remember, we're missing two amino acids. So we are going to have to go further along in the sequence. And so by doing the math, you know, three nucleotides for one amino acid and, and so on, I can have a predicted splice site of 37,633. So I moved along to that site in the contig, and what do you know, it was right there, right at this predicted si uh, splice site, 37,633. We also have computer programs, again using algorithms, that help us predict where these, these splice sites are going to be. And so it's always good to get this nice little pink bar below whatever <coughs> you are saying is your inside or your start site, uh, indicating that indeed this is a high donor site, uh, the computer agrees with me, which is always good, and um, that this is the end of our first exon. So, that is the annotation of the first exon. Now, genes have a lot more than just one exon. So I'm gonna show you a middle exon and an end exon, and I'm not gonna go through all the nine exons that, that we went through. Um, so the importance of a frame comes into play when we're looking at a phase. Now, a phase is probably what students are going to find as the most difficult concept to grasp. 
And, uh, but this is the most important part because this is, this is what is going to help us determine if we have multiple GTs in one site, well, how are we going to determine which GT is the actual inside if they're right next to each other, like this example? So we look at the phases. Now, a phase has to do with what frame we're in. So we see frame one, frame two, and frame three, and what frame we're in in the next exon. And the two should match up. So both figures are being read in the third reading frame. So we can ignore the first two frames. Those mean nothing to us anymore. And remember, that's given by the blast. Here in the third frame, we see that the amino acid ends at this G. But we have two amino acids that are, or two nucleotides that are still left for this one amino acid. Well, we can't have that. That doesn't make a full amino acid. We still have two nucleotides that are left over. And remember that an amino acid always requires three nucleotides. So my next phase should be a phase of one. So two nucleotides plus one nucleotide will give us a, an amino acid. And so we won't just have extra nucleotides hanging over in our sequence. So we have a phase of two here and a phase of zero here. Because there are no, no amino acids that are hanging over. This would complete the full amino acid. <clears throat> We go to our next exon and look at its AG site. <coughs> right here we see that we have the AG and then one T. And we come down and we see that, oh, you know, we have a phase of zero here. Well, if we have a phase of zero at the beginning, we should have a phase of three for the end site. So, here we see that there is zero here and zero here. So those two would match up. There'd be no extra nucleotides. So a phase of one must be matched up with a phase of two. A phase of two would be matched up with a phase of one. A phase of three would be matched up with a phase of zero and zero. Um, and then we would also have, if you had no nucleotides, zero and no nucleotides, zero. So this is how we're determining if we have two GTs or two AGs that are in the same site, how are we knowing which one is actually going to be that, uh, the, the actual GT site, and this is how we determine that. All right, so now we're going to look at a middle exon. We can see that this one's a little bit easier than our first exon because our lengths match up which means that our query sequences should be, our AGs and our GTs should match up exactly where our uh, query sequence is. We are in frame one, so now we're not gonna be looking at frame three anymore. Frame two, we're gonna be looking at frame one. So again, we would be looking for an AG acceptor site at 37,534 base pairs. We go to that site and we see that we have an AG right around the same spot. Um, it is important to note that AGs and GTs are not included in our final protein, uh, or excuse me, our mRNA. Those, those parts are cut out. We don't keep them. So when I say that the start of the exon is at 37,535 um, base pairs, that is because we're not including this AG. We're using it to find the start, but we're not including it. So the start of the exon is at five, 57,530, or excuse me, that, that got backwards. It's 37,535, but our AG site is at 37,537. So then again, we would look for a GT site for that same exon. We see that we have two GTs, and again, we're gonna use phasing to determine which GT it actually is. So we have two possible donor sites. They're both supported by the predicted splice site, so we can't use the computer to determine which one it is. And so we look at this one. We are in a frame. If we go back, we are in frame one. So we're going to be looking in the first frame. 
So it's this frame right here. So with this GT, we would have one G left over for this amino acid. So we'd have a phase of plus one. Therefore, the next exon should have a phase of two. If we are looking at this GT site, we have a phase of two. And so the next exon would be in a phase of one. We find that, I'm not going to go show you this, but we have an acceptor site of phase two. Therefore, we have to use phase one in this, in this case, because our AG phase of our next exon is a phase of two. So we have to use a phase of one in this case. One plus two equals three, right? <laughs> All right. And so we would continue this throughout the entire contig, or excuse me, the entire gene, and uh, go ahead and annotate every single exon, uh, looking at AG sites, GT sites, using phases to determine those. The only difference is in the final exon, which is kind of similar to the beginning exon. So remember, in the first exon, we were looking for an ATG site. So now we're going to be looking for something called a stop codon. And these are determined by sp uh, specific nucleotide sequences. Uh, and those are right up here. So if we have a TGA, a TAG, or a TAA, we would have a stop codon. And this means, guess what? You're your gene is done, you know, you're, you have no more exons after this. It's, it's over with. So uh, the computer helps us out because we're looking at a lot of nucleotides at one time. So it puts a nice red stop sign basically for us. So a stop sign saying, you know, this is, this is the end. We are in frame one, so uh, that matches up. We also see that our computer programs are, you know, agreeing with us. This is the, the stop site, you know, your, your protein, or excuse me, your, uh, well, your protein would end here. Your nucleotide sequences are ending here. Another thing that's really important is that we're using these black bars. These were melanogaster sequences. And they end in the same spot that we're finding Malkovensis to end which is important because we're, we're using the two to match up and determine you know, where these, these sites are. So we can see that uh, Melanogaster agrees with Malkovensis. And that's not always the case, but uh, in, this, in, in this example, it is. Okay. Okay. All right, so now we use a program called Gene Model Checker. A Gene Model Checker is really um, a, check, a double check for us. We plug in all of these sites that we found for each exon, let it know what gene we're looking at and where we found our stop uh, codon coordinates, and it goes back in the <coughs> genome browser and checks all of our numbers for us. That way, you know, if, if we accidentally put 37,289, and that's wrong, it would say, oh, wait, stop, we would get a fail here, and it would say, no, that, that's, not, that, that's not actually a GT site. You need to go back and, and look at what you were writing and make sure that, you know, that actually, uh, the, the, the numbers match up with a GT site. So it's a double check for us. And this is what we hope to see. This is not what we usually see. We usually see a bunch of fail, 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 fail. And then we have to go back and double check everything that we looked at originally. Um, and so at the end, we get this nice custom gene model. So this is a finished exon, or excuse me, a finished gene with all of our exons that we looked at. Uh, this, we can see that the computer programs are agreeing with us to certain points, and this is why we can't use just the computer programs to figure this out, because you know, a few, they, they disagree with each other, and so we have to do a hands-on approach and go and do this ourselves, which hopefully works out better. Um, we also see a really close uh, correlation between Mohavensis, the Mohavensis gene, to the Melanogaster gene, except that 
there's this big exon at the end, and melanogaster is broken into two exons. And that you can you can see then the difference in the species. Um, while we are, uh, and this would code differently for the protein and may have a different effect on its configuration and things of that sort. Um, but it is important then to know exactly what, what is going on. We only see, um, what is it, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight exons, and then there's nine exons in the melanogaster gene. Okay, that's an annotation. So, um, Josh is going to come up and tell you about more of the problems that we have. It's not always as simple as, as what we just explained. Okay, so for the past six months we've been working on this, we've encountered two major problems. Um, the most major one that I would argue is that we had one project where we went to our blast sequence our first exon, which had our start code on, wasn't there. So our second one also was that we had premature stop codons. Um, we'll get to that in a little bit. So our first problem, you notice here, here is our sequence that the last lined up. And over here, when you remember uh, the gene record finder, the amber head with all the green squares, this is just a different way of showing what that gene looks like. So here are all the exons. Our first one right here, we're in the plus strand. We're at 25 amino acids. Um, so here it is, 25 amino acids. Frame minus two. So we're supposed to be in the plus strand. Um, this winded up in the opposite direction. And next we have all these letters indicate a specific amino acid. Um, methionine is indicated with an M. And we see right here, why? So if we use this um, model for our gene model, the protein we need to start because there is no start code on it. So what we have to do now is do a little bit more detective work. So we have no idea where this exon is, um, how long it is. We would expect it to be around 25 amino acids, so that's about the same length. And this is where our um, computer programs come into play. So we have three of them saying, well, there looks like there's something right here. So when we blow it up, this is what we get. And right at the beginning, methionine. So that's the first indication to say we need to look at this a little bit more in detail. And as we go down, there are no stop codons in this frame, so there's no um, way that the protein would stop prematurely. And when we count all these amino acids, it comes out to 23. So we're missing two amino acids, but this is the best thing that we have, and we can always extend farther down to look for our GT site. So next thing we have to do, we look at the start, which is pretty straightforward. There's methionine, third reading frame, and then we go into our um, the end of the gene, or I mean, excuse me, the first exon. And there is a GT sequence right here, right where the gene predictors um, thought it was. So we look, um, to look for the phase, we have to be in the third reading frame, because that's where methionine is. We go down, this is the only part that's included with this codon, so we have a phase of one, meaning that the next um, exon, which we do have an alignment for, <coughs> needs to have a phase of two. So here's our next one. We're in a frame of plus two. And when we look right here, we have our AG site. And when we go down to the second reading frame, this A and T are included in our axon. So that's a phase of two. So everything lines up. So once we get done saying, OK, we think we found a gene, I mean, excuse me, an exon that has methionine so we can have the protein even start in the organism. We go through the entire protein with all the exons and we get all of our coordinates. Next thing we have to do is plug them all in, let the gene uh, model checker check it and say, okay, everything looks good, there's no major problems. So then we can say that with all of our information, with the gene model checker, with um, our computer programs that predicted that first exon, 
and with our phasing, it all corroborates to um, for us to say that this is the most likely start for this gene with the information that we have. And as we see right here, um, our check for our start codon is good, our donor site, so the phase of our end of the first exon where we found our GT site is good, and our acceptor is good. So when these two pass, that's telling you, okay, the phase on the donor site matches up with the phase on the acceptor site. So um, in, uh, in reality, this could actually be a junction. And then once we do that, we'll send it off. And if the uh, individuals at GEP find any other problems, they would send it back to us. And we also explain ourselves as to how we came about this, because it's not really standard procedure. We had to go in, look for it with um, no glass alignment. So if everything looks OK, they'll say OK, put it in a database, everything's good. Okay, our next problem, premature stop codons. So whenever a um, mRNA strand is being translated into a protein, when there's a stop codon, translation stops. That's where the end of the protein is. So if you have a protein that's nine exons long, you're in the fifth exon, and you include a stop codon, you're cutting off four exons, which means probably depending on the uh, size of your exons, half the protein is gone, most likely function is lost, um, it's not even usable by the organism. So um, what we have to do is, uh, whenever we put our gene model checker in, it will tell us right here, additional checks, fail, found a premature stop code on. So we have to go through each and every AG and GT site and look through all of our exons to figure out where that is because that means that we have to look for another GT site. So if we were right here, if we had put either this GT site or this GT site as our end of that exon, it would have failed us because there's a stop on right here, assuming that we're in the first reading frame, of course. So then what we'd have to do is say, okay, well, there's a GT right here, and remember this GT site is not included in our exon, so it's removed. This stock codon is completely gone. None of this sequence is left in our gene model. So then we would put it back in. If everything looks OK, it would come up as a pass. And then we can say, OK, everything looks good, submit it. The people at GPP look at it. Um, if they see any problems, they'll send it back. If not, it goes in database. So uh, some concluding thoughts just overall on uh, annotation. First, um, we'll just have to remember these projects have not been annotated before we have um, looked at them, so no one's even attempted it. So this is complete raw data, and we're just getting straight locations of genes and exons. And then next, the projects are submitted, stored in a database, and um, other scientists interested in Drosophila or anything else referring to um, the genes and proteins that we predicted can be used for further experimentation. So this um, database can be a launching point for other um, more detailed experiments. Um, next, our results um, of projects have been submitted and for eventual publication. So all the students that work on this get their work recognized by um, their peers and in a actual journal. And um, for students here that are interested, you know, this is something that we want to continue at Adams State. This is where you actually get to do some research at an undergraduate level, which um, is relatively rare, and you get your work recognized. You have publications, um, you have a more detailed um, knowledge about bioinformatics, um, always something good to put on a resume. And lastly, um, with all of our projects, we have actually had the opportunity to go to San Diego for a scientific meeting and present a poster about our project. So we're actually getting to go to other places, um, present this information to um, other members of the scientific community. And lastly, um, special thanks, Porter Scholars Program. They funded all of our wet lab, 
um, some of our travel. Um, without you guys, it would be impossible for us to even do this. Adams State College provide the facilities um, as far as a place to do our wet lab tests, some of the equipment. Thank you very much. And lastly, to GEP for um, allowing us to do the annotations and to provide training for us. Um, it's a really great experience. So if you're um, interested, please talk to Dr. Bedard. Uh, through Porter Scholar, so they could get yeah, so if you guys are interested in becoming Porter Scholars, apply. March 1st is the next deadline. Oh, uh, I had a question. From a, when you were talking about classes and some of the problems that you have. Um, why, why, why would class sequence not going out starting on? Why would it be the brain be reversed? All glass does is look for random sequences that line up. It has nothing to do with function, what's included. Just if there's an M that matches up and all the amino acids. It's just purely a random. So it's a problem with the software, is that? It's not really a problem. That's its only function is to just find, because you have 40,000 nucleotides that you're trying to find where stuff is. That gives you a starting ground where you can line stuff up. And mostly, um, you'll get good alignments, but other times you, you won't. And that's just because either it's different, so that exon was completely different from the line of gastric, and that's why we, as students, go through an annotation, because those are things that computer programs can't pick up. Yeah. Matt, the last is basically looking at is taking the long ACGTs and basically taking picking out almost like words and sentences mm -hmm. and then doing local alignments there. So when so it does that, if there's any changes and if there's a beyond a cutoff point, the similarity, it just cuts it right off. So the blast sequence is actually from the known. Yeah, so it's between the query and the subject. Gotcha. Any other questions? Or the scientific challenge. <laughs> How do you get what you start with? How do you get the A's, yeah. G's, and C's. Yeah. Well, there's this is this is only half of the process. We also, when uh, I was able to go to St. Louis, we also did training in a in finishing, and finishing is the first part, and it comes before annotation. So we go ahead and we break up the the DNA, and we were doing this in our wet lab. This was our wet lab <laughs> portion. <laughs> well, it's a long process. <laughs> Then, I mean, what kind of equipment do you need? Well, I don't know. Josh, do you want to kind of explain some of the wet lab? And then I'll explain finishing. So DNA is just a long sequence, and the GDP, which does most of it, there's just a machine called a sequence. And all it does is it will take that, and the A's, C's, G's, and T's get different signals. So what you'll have on a computer is just a bunch of different peaks, and those peaks correspond to different groups, so adding and volume. And, finding, and then it just reads it out. So, it's a very long process. And so finishing, you go in and the computer has read out what A, what, what is an A, what is a T, what is a G, what is a C, and you go through and you make sure that that is the actual nucleotide in the sequence. But basically, you're tagging the nucleotide and with some kind of label, and then the computer will read it. Um, that's, that's and then it's the, all stored on the database. That's, That's the simplest way I, I think I can explain it. So, if that makes sense. So, tag it, make it, make an A blue. And so, when the computer reads blue, oh, that's an A. So, that's that's kind of how it's done. So kind of along the lines, basically. you have an organism, you have to extract all the DNA from it. Then you chop it all up, and you have to the copies. <laughs> well, okay, now we're getting the real ones. There's special enzymes, almost like little molecular scissors that are cut up in pieces. And you make lots of copies of that, reassemble it, start getting sequences out. And then once the sequence is out, then we can do the Then we part. can do an adaptation. Yeah. So. The finishing itself, and you're actually doing some of that in the summer, too. That, that alone is you know, hours upon hours, weeks of work. Yeah. Thank you.
Well, I think we have a class team here next, so let's thank our speakers again. Adam State College. Great stories begin here.